Welcome to Codex History of Video Games. I'm Mike Coletta. And I'm Tyler Osby. And today we're talking about Activision. We're doing part two of our history of Activision. Part two. I think it's going to be three total parts because we'll get to we, we we get to a spot where we're it's a good ending spot and we go into like more modern Activision. So we're there's like three distinct phases of Activision. I think for the layperson. Okay. So sounds good. So, well, I'm excited to get started, Tyler. I'm ready. I'm ready for yeah. Activision. So when we last left our Activision heroes, they had successfully broken away from Atari and started their own third-party development house. They were among the first companies to ever do this because back in those days, the maker of the hardware also made the games. That was just how it was. If you made a console, you were the one that made the games for it. Nobody else made games for it. Um, but Activision had just won in court over whether it was okay or not for them to make games for someone else's console, which uh, opened the floodgates for anybody who wanted to make games for Atari to do that. And they did. Boy, did they. Um, they Activision's deal with Atari ended up, uh, they had to like pay some royalties or something like that. So it wasn't just like, ah, and now anybody can do it. It was like there was an agreement there. So I'm assuming all these other companies maybe set up agreements as well. But um, yeah, so Activision released a ton of games in 1980 and they were super successful. Uh, by 1982, there were a ton of other companies also releasing games for the Atari who were emboldened by the runaway success that Activision was seeing. But Activision was actually making good games. And a lot of these other developers and publishers just saw dollar signs and they just put out a ton of garbage. Um, there's a paragraph here from that's just ripping straight from Wikipedia because I think it nails it perfectly. The rapid growth of the third party game industry was easily illustrated by the number of vendors present at the semi-annual Consumer Electronics Show. The number of third party developers jumped from three to 30 between two consecutive event, events, so 10x. Um, at the summer 1982 CES, there were 17 companies, including MCA Incorporated and Fox Video Games, announcing a combined 90 new Atari games. Yeah. By 1983, an estimated 100 companies were attempting to leverage the CES into a foothold in the market. Atari Age documented 158 different vendors that had, de that had developed for the Atari VCS. In June 1982, the Atari games on the market numbered just 100. By December, that number grew to over 400. Experts predicted a glut in 1983 with only 10% of games producing 75% of sales, end quote. That's the whole thing. So companies just really just started taking off here once they realized that other people could make games for the Atari. It didn't have to just be Atari making games for Atari. They, sound, they found dollar signs. They just saw dollar signs and they were going yep. for it. Yep. It's a classic bubble situation. And I think a lot of those uh, those development companies were just like, We'll just start up and we'll find programmers. And they didn't necessarily find people who were like game designers, right? They just found people who could technically make a game or make software that ran on an Atari. And so a lot of these games weren't very good. And that sort of like paints the picture here, that, that paragraph there, I think. There were just too many games and absolutely zero quality control. Most of the games were just like copies of each other or copies of copies. And not like, you know, like how when a genre becomes popular, like Soulsborne games get really popular. And then there's other games that are like, uh, like it, like a Jedi Fallen Order. It's like kind of a Soulsborne style game, but you wouldn't say it's like it's just a straight ripoff. It's mm -hmm. like it's just a similar in style, right? These games were like basically straight up ripoffs, like just like copies of copies of copies, and they just got worse as you went. It goes um, back to our whole discussion last week with the history of like Nintendo before video games. That everyone was just doing Pong. We're all yeah. making Pong, and that's how it works now. Yep, and that's what at that times like that's all video games were was just Pong. So if you were making a video game, you were making Pong. That's um, and that's so it was like branching out a little bit here, but a lot of those genres were just like there's just like a lot of Space Invaders clones, a lot of Pac Man clones, a lot of you know that kind of stuff. Um, so it was like it's like uh you know when you go on Steam and you find like a, a Unity based like like asset flip game where it's just like they just went onto the Unity store and like bought a bunch of assets, made a game that's not really a game that but you can it works i guess and like then they sold it and they made a bunch of money that's like what was going on you're here. like why have i seen this same tree in 15 different indie games in the last yeah, year <laughs> exactly so there was really no way for the public to like really discern quality at the time so like nowadays we got the internet so if you're like into it if you're into games you're in the scene the good games sort of float to the top and they become the topic of discussion right um but back then you just you just kind of went to the store you looked at a title on the box. Maybe it had screenshots on the back. If it were an Activision game, if it weren't an Activision game, it might not even have screenshots on the back. If you were like a real nerd, maybe you read a magazine and you probably got had a better idea then. Um, but most folks, there really was no good way to find out which games were good and which were bad. And most of them were bad. They were really, really, really <laughs> bad. Um, so I don't want this to turn into like 
the history of the crash of 1983 because I think we've kind of covered that in some of our uh, like ultimate history of video games episodes and stuff like that. But it is uh, an important thing that happened to all companies operating in this time. And it's, uh, you know, you, if you look at it, if you really squint, it's kind of Activision's fault, right? Or at least their actions led to it. I don't know if I would say it's their fault because they were they were making good games. They weren't making garbage. Yeah, right? I think it's like an unintentional reaction yeah. to to what was done you know because atari had all good things at heart at the beginning but right they couldn't yeah, have so, foreseen that yeah and so yeah there was just no quality control and and so like in hindsight yeah maybe atari should have done some sort of quality control there but we, hey, we just didn't know this was gonna happen right um so basically with all those crappy games coming out consumers just really had no way to know what was good they only had name recognition to go off of so uh, there were there are two games that are sort of pointed to that the crash is not the fault of these two games, uh, like oh no these games came out and then everything died. It's not it's not the fault of those two games only. It's just those two games made it were like the tipping point, right? Um, and the reason that they were is because of the name recognition. Where I'm talking about ET, uh, which is widely regarded as not a great game, although maybe some folks would argue. Some right? folks some folks like it. That's fine. That's I really okay. don't have an opinion on it because I haven't yeah. really even played it, but. Yeah, that's okay if you like it. But it pe people just it, it it was opaque and it was hard to play. And uh, you know, so maybe if you got good at it, you had fun. I don't know. But also Pac Man, which was uh, not a, not like a game based on a like a movie, like a licensed movie thing. It was kind of a a port of the extremely popular Pac Man game uh, in the arcades, right? Like this is a game that people knew was good because they had already played it in the arcades, and when it came out on Atari. The port was really bad, and there's really no excuse for that. Yeah, it was, it was bad. You I know? think we talked we talked about this a little bit in the Ultimate History of Video Games too. They mentioned how this yeah. port was not great. Yeah, the port was not great. The Ms. Pac-Man port that would come out like a little while later, that one was much better. Mm -hmm. But basically, you look at a game like uh, uh, E.T. and and by and large, the consensus is this game is not good, just garbage. Um, but this was the point of no return because you couldn't even trust that E.T., something based on uh, like a popular thing, you couldn't trust that that was going to be good. You couldn't even trust that Pac-Man, a game you knew already was good, you couldn't even trust that that was good. Do you have, and so, do you have experience with E.T.? Have we talked about this yet? Have you? Uh, a little bit. I mean, like a passing curiosity. I haven't spent a lot of time with I, it. I played it as a child, I feel like, for maybe five minutes before yeah. I gave up. So I feel like I have nothing to say. So I'm always wondering like, if you see, if you have an opinion. Did you like get an like play it recently or did you play it a while ago i mean probably 10 or yeah. 15 years ago you know whenever i first learned about the the crash in the 80s and i was like i wonder what that game how bad had that was it was that game you know yeah and that, when everyone heard about the story with the desert so everyone wanted, wanted to know like if it, how course, bad it really yeah. was yeah which turned out to be true although not to the extent that uh that, that people would have claimed that like every single Atari, et cartridge was buried in the desert some of them were though um but yeah so it's like you, you can't like et was bad pac-man was bad you couldn't tell whether something was going to be good or bad and so all you had to go off of was these like popular names and not even those games were good so th th at this point it's like why even try i don't want to buy games anymore they're all bad even the ones i think are going to be good or the ones i should know are good are not i can't it's the good times are over right games are done <laughs> um and that was kind of the first time we'd see a video game fad get really big and then immediately kind of die off and it was video games as a whole which we'll see sort of repeat in, in throughout history that sort of thing repeats itself but not uh not to the extent that like the entire industry falls more like just like specific genres uh which activision does have a uh, hand in at least some of those uh running some of those games into the ground but we'll get to that at a later episode i think we won't get that get to that today. juicy gossip that's what it sounds yeah. like yeah um this was a bad time to be in the biz and uh, activision was kind of just getting started which was a real bummer for them um the other thing was so Activision was actually making good games. There are, you know, quality games, I'm sure, on a game-to-game -game basis, we can debate if it's good or not. But like, by and large, they were making decent games, especially compared to the garbage that was out there. And they sold their games for $40, which is $127 in 2023 dollars. So these were expensive games. Um, but during this crash, the front of every store had like a bin of just like $5 games, right? Just uh, So why would you buy one $40 game for your kids when you could just get eight for the same price right mm -hmm. even if the games aren't as good it's kind of hard to beat quantity you know um so the activision games which were actually good didn't really sell very well because they just couldn't compete on price um and pc gaming was also starting to take off a bit here so the extra competition there was was pretty tough um and atari was getting into that space as well 
So at this point, we're in like 1982, 1983, the original Gang of Four is starting to break up. Larry oh, no. Kaplan. Yeah. Larry Kaplan went back to Atari. He got a vice president <laughs> position. The old boomerang, which I've seen in my life before. Um, Alan Miller and Bob Whitehead went off to form Accolade, which would go on to do some stuff. I don't know if they're still around, actually. I don't think so. I can, um, I can do some Googling while you while you keep going here. Yeah, do, do a quick Google. Where's the Google? Um, David Crane stuck around to keep making games a little while longer at Activision, but this was kind of the end of early era Activision. Um, and at this point in time, the Atari VCS, also known as the 2600, was kind of an old and decrepit system. Um, Atari had released a successor, the 5200, but it really wasn't taking off in the way the original system had back in the day because it wasn't backward compatible. And its competition, the ColecoVision and the Intellivision, those were compatible with VCS Ooh. cartridges with an adapter. So it's like, even if you buy a new Atari, you can't play old Atari games. I don't even have to buy an Atari. I can play old Atari games. Yeah. Uh, By the way, Accolade, no longer a company. They were purchased in 1999 and then kind of made into a smaller subsidiary with something else by the company Infograms. Grames? Okay. It's French. Info, Infogra Infogram? Infogram. Yeah, if I'm, I'm not gonna, the S I'm not gonna try to pronounce again. You know how I do with pronunciation <laughs> on this podcast with other names. Yeah, so the the 5200 is kind of fizzled out. Um, but the nice thing about being a third party developer, though, is that you are not bound to making games for any one system. So while Atari was faltering, Activision could just make games for other systems or even for PCs, and that's what they did. They focused on PC games during this time, which was probably a good call because while game consoles were still recovering from the crash. Home computers were actually doing fine, um, especially in places like the UK. I, I don't know why I like pointed in a direction like that's where the UK is. <laughs> that's the way the UK um, is. Yeah, uh, but especially like in the UK and in Europe, like computers were a little bit more popular. Um, so that, uh, they, yeah, they were doing okay. So, I, and I think you can also like the the reason that they were doing a little better is because you can easily justify getting a, a computer for something like work or organization or like boring computer stuff, spreadsheets, whatever. Like there's like a, a legitimate non game reason to get a computer, but playing games is kind of a bonus. So uh, that adds to the value rather than being like the whole thing's reason for existing. Right. So uh, parents or, or homes would like get a computer and then the kids would be able to play games on it, even though that wasn't the primary purpose of the computer. That's how um, I got into space cadet pinball right there. Just describe yeah. it. It's because of we've Microsoft Word. Thank you, Microsoft of, Word. We've all played a lot of Space Cadet Pinball. That's right. That's the that's the move right there. Yeah. So now we're getting to the part where Activision makes kind of its first big acquisition, and that's Infocom. Um, they had been around through the game crash like Activision, but they had pivoted to making productivity software after games became less profitable. It didn't really work out for them, but the folks at Activision knew that there was talent there that could be put to use making games. And Infocom is uh, best known for probably the massively popular Zork text-based adventure game. Um, That's something I've yeah. been meaning to cover on this podcast for so long. Just text adventures in general. It's one of the big topics we haven't gotten to yet, and it drives me crazy that we yeah. haven't done and it yet. Zork is like That's kind the of the gold one. standard. Yeah, I just feel like yeah. we need an expert. We need someone who's like, played these games at the time they came out which is not yeah me. that was before Same. tyler and i's time it so far before so our far time. before our time yeah um so yeah but but that game was massively popular so they knew that they had like the chops to make good games right um and they made some other games also the battletech uh game which was set in the 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 battletech universe which is kind of a fictional universe sort of like warhammer or forgotten realms or something like that like there's like lots of stuff that are set in that universe um, that universe is also known for the Mech Warrior series, which is a series of games yeah. uh, that's near and dear to my heart, at least the second one, because uh, the second Mech Warrior game came with um, the my first Windows PC that we ever got. Oh, um, that's a good memory. So I, yeah, I played a lot of it. And we had like this super cool enhanced version of it because because of the like whatever graphics card that PC had, like there was a special enhanced version of Mech Warrior for it. So it had like textures, which was like, oh my gosh. Look at the textures. Yeah, whenever I see gameplay of Mech Warrior 2 and it's like the the actual like version that most people got, I'm like this game doesn't look very good. But when I when I checked it out, the ATI Rage version, I was like, dang, this game looks pretty this cool. This was being... I think PAX 2015 is when they had the old Mech Warrior there with the full controls like the Mech Ooh. cockpit and they had like 16 of them set up. 
so you could play in these big games with people and it was so fun like i got so cool. i kind of got in trouble because i was like going through the menus they were like very like apparently it sounded like if you pick the wrong thing the whole game is gonna bork essentially it's just gonna break and they were like you have to pick these very specific mechs and follow our instructions and i was like looking through the lists and stuff and they're like don't do that <laughs> i got like kind of oh, yelled because it was you were playing like the actual original game yeah so that was like um... all this like technical things and settings and how you had to set stuff up and i don't even know if i even like actually blew up another mech the entire time i played but it was like so fun just like trying to pilot it with the controls those games are hard they're so hard it was so hard i got i got like murdered by multiple friends and they were like got you and i'm like oh this would have been so fun if i had had like another hour and a half to like figure out what was going on but we played it for like they gave us a good like 30 minutes on it which is pretty good for like a expo you know when you're there yeah. and there wasn't really a line because it was kind of like at that point vintage you know hardware yeah. but even though i'm like it's xbox was what the the age of it was as far as the mech warrior game we were playing it wasn't even that old um, oh okay yeah it wasn't the first mech warrior then actually oh I don't, it wasn't like dos mech warrior no i don't even know what mech warrior it was honestly but it was definitely for original xbox and they had was it still battalion maybe that was the one that had like the big controller. Yeah, I think it was that yeah. then. It must have been that because they had like a bunch of them like hooked up all together. And then we were yeah, just playing. Yeah, that makes sense then. Okay, so and, you're playing Steel Battalion. Mm-hmm, but it was really fun. Yeah. And I was like looking up like how much do these cost? But then I, I felt like I was getting dangerously close to being a flight sim guy, which I can't do. It's nothing against flight sim guys. It's just that's a whole new thing. It's like being a train guy. You know, you can't. Yeah, there's a lot. It takes a lot of room to be up, a flight sim guy. Yeah, you get up that list and then you start, before you know it, you're recognizing locomotives by their engine sounds and you can't do that anymore. You got to yeah, move on. Yeah. You got to move on. With your life. I, I know people who are like racing sim people too. Oh, you know, yeah. they just have like the whole setup. And that's so cool. But I'm also like, there's this just too many things. There's too many games yeah. to play. Yeah, racing sim, also boating, like, uh, like hydroplanes and that kind of stuff. My brother plays like farm games and ranch sims and he likes that and that's a whole new thing that you can go down i feel like the the sim world is a very different video game world than the games that i feel like most people that listen to this podcast are like playing like you're yeah you're i booted up farming simulator because it's on game pass recently my grandpa was a farmer and i was like all right time to go step into grandpa clint's shoes and i i couldn't figure it out and i i got bored of it quickly but uh, my like, cousins really liked it i guess did you what what were you trying to farm what crop were you going for there i i think i got into the tutorial and i realized that like i couldn't just drive the the machinery the combine i had to like turn it on and like extend the arm and like oh. and i was like oh i don't know if i can handle this right now like, I, I haven't gone back to it you just wanted grand theft auto with a combine is what you were looking yeah, for I, yeah i, I yeah, gotcha. know what i was looking for you just wanted to see potato number go up do you even harvest potatoes yeah. with the combine i don't even know how this works <laughs> we, don't, we don't even I don't know, know. Uh, yeah uh, it would be wheat is what i would mm-hmm. want to harvest probably wheat that i think wheat's cool. a combine thing yeah yeah that's what my my grandpa did um sorry for the long yeah. tangent but that's this podcast so welcome to yeah. it, everybody Anyway, yeah, Infocom didn't invent Battle t- BattleTech like the universe, but they did make a very popular game set in that universe. So they weren't bad developers. That's the whole point of that. Like they made good games, right? But by 1989, Activision just they had shut them down, um, which is kind of a pattern that uh, big publishing companies like EA and Activision will go through. So they'll buy a company that that's doing very well or isn't doing very well, but made good games. And then they'll sort of like, mismanage them or something happens and like they stop making good games and then they just sort of shut them down and everybody's sad about it this was kind of the first time that happened to activision no i think we're gonna see a pattern here yeah so uh and then jim levy who was the ceo from the beginning uh he was like really excited for this acquisition he really wanted it to work out um david crane says in in one of the articles i was looking at that, that he was just like a little bit too optimistic through the crash and he was eventually replaced um by a person named bruce davis at the behest of the board, which I wrote in capital, the letters. infamous the board, board of companies. This is just like secession. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And so Bruce Davis was brought in to turn this ship around, I guess. Um, and he was described by Crane as having no creative or marketing skills, and that, uh, and at that point, the last surviving member of the Gang of Four, David Crane, he was like, "I got to get out of here. This is not the same place it was when we started it." And uh, we brought in this new CEO who doesn't get it. I got to go. It's it's time. Um, and this is probably one of the moments where it went wrong for Activision, uh, so to speak, because like the start of this uh, this saga is like, ah, they're the rebels rebelling against Atari, making great games and like crediting their developers and like generally being a force for good in the video games industry. Um, Bruce Davis coming in, 
was kind of a turning point. Um, and so once he comes in and in the last of the gang of four leaves, we see Activision kind of turn into something that it wasn't. Uh, in fact, they changed their name at this point. Ooh, really? Activision did. Yeah. Well, they kind of did. I think they did more of a like, like a Google, you know, how Google is actually Alphabet and then Google is like one of the brands underneath Alphabet. Oh, yeah. They kind of did that. So they changed their name to Mediagenic. So we've entered the Mediagenic era of Activision history. It's 1988 and Mediagenic has expanded beyond games and into other kinds of software. Uh, so the company was divided into four parts. It was divided into Activision. That's the part that was a video game publisher for various platforms, the Nintendo uh, Master System, the not the Nintendo Master System, but the, you know, regular <laughs> Nintendo, the Sega Master System, the Atari 7800, Atari ST, Commodore 64, oh, all of those games. It was also Infocom, um, and they made interactive fiction games. Um, and then GameStar, which was uh, an independent company that was bought by Activision in 1986. They made sports games. Um, and then another company called 10.0, which made business software. So I guess this is one of those places where it's like, we make software. Some of it's games, some of it's not games, but that's what we do is make software. We don't focus on something, um, but these like sort of subsidiaries or sub companies or divisions, I don't know what the proper business term is for it, but like they were all under the Mediagenic banner. So Mediagenic's the big one. And then yeah. Activision is now a smaller part, but it was yeah, Mediagenic is the alphabet or the meta mm -hmm. to uh, Activision's Google or Facebook, right? Gotcha. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so Infocom closed in 1989 and then Mediagenic was just like never really able to get anything done. They didn't turn any profits. They were constantly having to lay people off. Bruce Davis was going to run this company into the ground, just like he had ran Imagic into the ground, which is another company that he like was CEO of and then it tanked. And so he jumps on to be CEO somewhere else. Is that kind of wild how like the CEOs get jobs, totally fail at running company, just like blast it straight into the ground and they just bounce and do it again somewhere else. Like who is giving these people second chances, right? If you've already ran a company into the ground, you should not be like, nobody should be handing you the keys to another company. And they get paid right? so much money. They get paid oh so much God. money to do this. That's what drives me crazy. So yeah. I'm like you're, you're making millions and millions of dollars and you're, you have a track record for running things into the ground. But that's the yeah. way the, the business works, I guess, is how I, yeah, it's capitalism. It, I don't know. I, I really don't. I really don't know. I have no and idea. the way they do the way they do this, too. I don't I don't know specifically about Bruce Davis, but like a lot of times these CEOs will have like things written into their into their contracts that like if you fire me because you don't like what I'm doing, you have to pay me a hundred million dollars mm -hmm. and then or or some like extreme amount of money. So that's why they, they, a lot of times bad CEOs get to stick around is because it will cost so much to get rid of them um, that they, they just get to stick around and be if you do get fired, you don't care. You're going to be rich either way. Yeah. You like have no Old personal. I, I feel bad for the original four that you've called them. Like yeah. That's got to see. You saw your dream turn into something else. And I feel like it's happened in so many other businesses for so many things where people start something with like, good intentions and mm -hmm. then it just becomes the, the monster they were trying to avoid in a way. Yeah. It just sort of gets away from you. Yeah. And, and then you, you know, you either die a hero or live long enough to see yourself become a villain. It's true. That's it. Activision live long enough to become a villain. That's right. Um, they are not Batman. I'll tell you that much. No, no. And one notable thing that, ha that happened during this time is they sort of missed out on Myst. So they had a deal with Cyan Worlds, the company that, that developed Myst, to deliver to distribute their games. And then they they lost it because they just could like, they were just bad at being a company, I guess. Um, and then a few years later, Cyan Worlds would release Myst. And uh, that's a real bummer for Activision. So that is whatever. a huge bummer for Activision. Yeah, so dang. Anyway, Activision's kind of in the in the tanks here. They're they're in the dumps. They're having a bad time, and uh, they're probably likely to go out of business soon. Except for one man. Here he is. It's the person I'm thinking it is, isn't it? It totally is. Oh, no. Bobby Kotick. <laughs> so as we're we're gonna find out with Bobby Kotick, we all hate him. Dude, dude is awful, right? Uh, it's in terms of like just like being bad for the industry doing money grubbing capitalism stuff right but the man can turn a company around at least he can turn activision around so he he gained an interest in the video game industry during the crash and he wanted to restore activision to its former glory so mediagenic was in huge trouble at this point in time uh, and even the activision name wasn't enough to save the company from the clutches of bobby kotick and in fact the activision name is what attracted bobby in the to begin with so um yeah, he's, he's like a villain now, but like at, at the time, he was just like a regular rich dude who just wanted to get into the video game industry, right? Um, 
So uh, to his credit, he knew the value of Activision, uh, and he knew that since Mediagenic was in trouble, that he could buy them at a dirt cheap price. Uh, basically, he saw dollar signs in the video game industry in the early 90s, and rather than start his own company and build it from scratch, he figured he could buy Mediagenic for the Activision name and get a real boost to his rep just from the name. So in 1991, he and a few other investors bought Activision for the low, low price of 500000 US dollars. That is so. How much are they worth currently? Have we looked this up? Oh man! Here, I mean, you could. Look I'll, up I'm, their, I'm gonna look it up. Market cap. Yeah. What's our market cap on the stock? I'm gonna look it up Actually. right now. Okay, you keep going. I'll look it up right now. Yeah. So Bobby Kotick became CEO immediately, and he laid off almost every single person who worked there. I think it was like single digits number of people who are still there after Bobby shows up and just slashes everything. So he decided to rebuild and restructure the company from scratch. But this strategy did have some upsides. He retained access to all of the Infocom library, which, as we all know, was the games were pretty good, even if they hadn't sold well or, uh, or you know, something Infocom wasn't didn't do well by the end. They had some pretty good games in their library, the Zorks and the BattleTechs and that kind of stuff. Um, and they also had a distribution network, MediaGenic slash Activision. They they had formed like you know relationships with retail stores and things like that that uh, this new Activision could obviously take advantage of. Um, and a distribution network is like really, really important when it comes to being in the retail space. So like more, maybe more important than the Activision name was that uh, retail distribution network. So as much as we hate Kodak today, like I said, you can't deny his skill as a CEO if you define skill as a CEO of like making lots of money, right? Or turning a company around, which is like making lots of money is impressive in its own. Um, but I think being able to turn a company around is like a, an especially impressive CEO skill to me. Because like, we could all say Tim Cook is the greatest CEO of all time because he's probably made the most money out of any CEO for a company or for stockholders, right? But he never had to turn that company around, right? Yeah. Everything was great when when he took over and he just continued making it great. And that's awesome. And that's that takes skill too. But but he's he didn't he he, he didn't do the Steve Jobs like get getting a hold of this company when it was on the brink of being dead and like turning it around, right? And that's what Bobby Kotick did. Uh, he did it at the huge price of like laying off a ton of staff and like just getting rid of a ton of stuff. Um, but like his skill at being the CEO and keeping a company alive, you kind of can't really deny it, right? Yeah, I found, uh, I found the market cap, by the way. Are you ready for it? Yeah. So they bought it for $500,000, right? Mm -hmm. 72.244 billion is the market cap right now. <sighs> That's a pretty good wow. investment, I would say, right? Pretty, pretty good, good turnaround. <laughs> <laughs> did they announce like how much Microsoft is trying to buy them for? Did that did that get disclosed? Oh, I'm I'm sure it is. Is that uh, like I don't know how these business deals work. Is that like public knowledge when that comes out? How much is Microsoft paying for Activision? 68.7 billion. So they're paying 68.7 billion, but their market cap is 72. But it's not going to be exact. It's always going to be a deal, right? Yeah, it's it, it, you get kind of a discount if you're buying the whole company. And know? they're also trying to like kind of rescue them from certain things like for example, the way they treat their employees is a primary reason yeah. I think most of us are upset with Activision. And probably we should look at the, you could look at the history of the Activision market cap too, because it probably shot up after it was like Microsoft. Oh was yeah. Sent. Cause they're like, right. look at this, look at how good this is going to go. We're going to get yeah. Microsoft. And, they're like, and here's Microsoft is like, here's how much we think this company is worth. So people will like, you know, so it makes sense that the, the market cap would, would yeah. rise. Well, I'm not a stock expert. So we all can, is it Kodak or Kodak? I have no idea how to say his last name. I think it's Kodak. Is it Kodak? Okay. Well, we so. can all hate on Bobby Kodak. But I guess he does know how to when to buy, you know, I guess yep. he got that business part down. Yep. He he did the business and uh, you can't really deny his skill there, even if uh, as gamers, we wish he would make different decisions. Um, and so anyway, he he uh, he met all his goals goals through the 90s of like he's like telling investors basically like, hey, we're going to we're going to break even by this time. We're going to make profit by this time. So he met all of those goals. Um, and then by 1997, he was like, we will be profitable by buying up lots of game like by having great games basically we're going to be pro profitable or, or having not great games by having games that people want to buy or that we'll pay money for which are closely correlated but not exactly the same mm -hmm. thing right i can see people just flaming in the com comments you know the games aren't great yeah call of duty's bad well okay call of duty's been it, the same money. for the last 10 years in which case yeah. well I would kind of agree with you in that sense but, yeah, we keep, but people keep buying yeah, it you know so. people people like it yeah. people like what people like you know yeah so that's kind of where I want to leave this one today. 
Uh, because we're going to, at this point, we're going to sort of transition into the next phase of Activision's life, which is just massive, massive growth. It's still the mid-90s. We've got a ways to go before becoming the behemoth we know as Activision today. Uh, Kodak has turned the company around from the brink of bankruptcy. Uh, but it's tough to say that this Activision is the same Activision that started as an Atari rebellion in 1979. It's really just a totally different company that just shares the name of that company. Like, that's one of the big reasons Bobby Kotick bought Acti or Mediagenic was just so that he could have the Activision name because that was associated with quality uh, back in, in the day. And, you know, to a certain extent, maybe today as well. Um, when you see a game is pu being published by Activision, it means something. I don't know if it if you get excited or, or <laughs> not, but it means something to people. Um, so yeah, I think it's uh, that th this new Activision is kind of interesting in its own right because it goes on to become one of the largest, maybe I think it might be the largest publisher in gaming today. Like maybe it in, between it and EA kind of. Yeah, maybe I think it's between close. those two. I don't know, I think about uh, the yeah. childhood games I had that like, cause I'm, I'm, the first Tony Hawk's Pro Skater was Activision, right? Yeah, not this, the first, yeah. they all are, I mean, but yeah. yeah. Tony Hawk, and, Call of Duty uh what else spyro yeah. crash and as a kid i just thought oh this is a great game you know i didn't really think about activision in that sense mm -hmm. so it's funny as an adult now that that's like a whole big deal in a way yeah so yeah i think in part three which i think will be the last part of this we'll cover the rise and rise of activision <laughs> through the late 90s <laughs> into the 2000s as they explode oh guitar hero um, oh man I can't wait. we're going to talk about the fads right the motion controls and plastic instruments take a look at some of the game series that they just drove straight into the ground i'm excited for it because like ea this is a company that makes tons of games that we all play and enjoy today uh but they also make a lot of decisions that feel bad for the industry um and so it's hard to say whether they're like a net positive like you know these are these are companies that have like put in like like overly predatory monetary or monetization systems in their games, but also they've made Tony Hawk pro skater. So it's kind of hard, you it's know, hard to, it's hard to, yeah, pick. It's really hard to pick. And even that, the latest Tony Hawk, the one and two remake, it's pretty good, man. It I don't is know fun. if you played it. It's oh, really I played weird. it. I played through all of it and I beat it. Cause I love it. Cause it's my childhood. Yep. It's all I wanted yep. to play. So, yeah. So that's like, that's the second part of, of Activision's life is after the gang of four leave. And it sort of flounders for a bit, and then Bobby Kotick buys them, and now we'll go into the Kotick era, as I'm calling it now. The Kotick era of the of the yeah. Activision time. Well, that was yeah. great. I mean, I yeah. feel like I'm learning so much. I didn't know Good. about Mediagenic at all. I had no clue. That was that was a, a brief flash in the pan time, but uh, yeah, they uh, they weren't Activision at that point. They were not. So what are you even playing, Mike? Ooh, okay. So I finally beat Baldur's Gate. I did what I said I would do last week. I beat it on Sunday night. And I beat the boss and it was a struggle and almost everyone was dead, but I beat the boss. Good. Um, and then I went back and I got my good ending. So I wasn't getting friend zoned by Shadowheart because that was a bummer when I got friends because mm -hmm. I, I did. So I did it twice. I ended the game by doing a certain decision you can make at the very end that kind of skips the boss fight. I did okay. that. And then I got an ending and I realized, oh, no, I'm not romancing the person I romanced because I didn't complete their quest. So then I went back a couple saves and went and did their whole quest thing. And then I went and beat the boss again. And I got to say, it was like, it was really fun. Like I, I really enjoyed that game. I'm going to play it again. I loved it, but I definitely just want to take a break because if I just burn myself out on it, it's not going to go well for me. So yeah. I am now playing Starfield, giving that a go. And I, I'm a little I'm I'm having fun and I'm playing it, but I definitely get the feeling that other people have where it's not a, it's good, but it's not like the hype that it's not like because we all had Skyrim. That's like Skyrim. It feels is like Skyrim in space. Yeah, which is great. Skyrim in space is fun, but it's not like some transcendent next level. Yeah. And currently thing. I I don't I'm not getting bored by like going back and forth. I am curious about the story. Like, what is this artifact? Like, what are mm -hmm. we doing? Like, this is kind of interesting to me, but I can see myself beating the main story campaign, which according to how long to beat is 18 hours and then stop playing the game. I, I can see myself doing that. Like it's just, yeah. I, I know there's so much to explore and see, but I'm just not that into it yet. That could change. I'm only like five hours in maybe. So what about yeah. you? What have you been playing? I've, well, I've been playing a little bit of Starfield as well. I've been enjoying, I'm doing the main quests sometimes, but then as other stuff pops up that I'm interested in, this is sort of how I do a lot of Bethesda games, especially like the Skyrims and stuff. I'll just go off and do something. If it sounds interesting, if it doesn't, I'll just let it sit in the quest log and I'll kind of keep moving forward. I'm having fun with that. I kind of wish leveling was a little bit faster because I see these skill trees and all these stuff that I want to unlock. And it really feels like it's taking a long time. 
um, which is a little bit of a bummer, but maybe that'll make it feel like, I don't know, a, a sense of pride and accomplishment when I get there. I don't know. Uh, but I've been having fun, like kind of flying the ship around and and uh, trying to stop spacers and uh, helping people do stuff in some of the side quests and then coming back to the main quest. And and I'm just, I'm trying not to like overly gamify what I'm doing, right? Like, I'm just like, I'm just doing whatever feels nice, whatever feels right. I don't feel like I need to stick to it and like keep coming back because I paid for it because it's on Game Pass and it will always be on Game Pass, I assume. So that's true. I am glad I did not pay money for it. I, yeah, I, I'm glad I didn't drop 70 bucks on this because I think I would be disappointed if I spent 70 bucks on it. But yeah, because it's on Game Pass, I have a whole different outlook to that. Yep. That's what I love uh, about Game Pass. Uh, it does create it sometimes a, like a uh, sort of like, you know, when you download like for emulators, if you get like every single game ever and you just feel like you have infinite choice and then you just make no choices. Yeah. Uh, not that I've ever done that. Of course, I <laughs> only play legally purchased. only play legally purchased video games so this is something i assume happens you own a copy of... and then you get a rom for it or you make right. your own rom make your own roms is really the as way we've to go. said for years right so anyway yeah yeah game pass gives you sort of that like too much choice where you feel like you don't have to stick with anything um but you know it's video games we're just trying to have fun so yeah who cares? no I, I'm, I, I, I am i did actually realize i did get a distress beacon on a planet I was doing the main story for and I diverted to that. That's where I'm at. Right yeah, now. So I, like I, am like, I am like cutting off and doing a different thing and saving people from spacers and I uh, using the boost pack because I made, I made sure to unlock the boost pack because I heard yeah. it's like, if you don't unlock it, you're just going to have to wait to level up to get it. And I'm like, I'm just going to do it now. So I have it. And that was great. Yeah. The boost pack is, is uh, definitely something you want. I kind of wish there was like a better way to traverse planets. Yeah. Like, the boost pack is fine, especially on some of the lower gravity planets. I but like walking is really slow. Yeah. I want a map like everyone has asked for. I want maps. Yeah. I am so tired of going to cities and getting lost and having to go to a wiki to find something. I think that's really yeah. frustrating. That's just weird yeah. choice to not include that. It's 2023 and uh, games should have maps in them. And also you can't even like make a universe thing for it where like in Skyrim, you could say like, well, what are you going to draw your own map? Okay, fine. Uh, but in, but like in, like we're in space. Like yeah. we all have computer like i don't know give me a map two things about space no one can hear you scream and they have maps clearly yeah yep everything is mapped done um so yeah so i've been playing a little bit of starfield um i did finish i'm kind of back on my call of duty grind like just trying to play through all of them uh which i was doing a few years ago and made it up to about world at war um and so i played through world at war i finished that a couple weeks ago i finished the first black ops last weekend um, and so now I'm like a little ways into black ops too. So I'm kind of doing that when I don't really have anything else, or I just kind of want something that I don't really have to pay that much attention to, you know? And, uh, what else? Oh, I've been playing a little bit of Baldur's Gate. Uh, I've been playing it with my partner. Mm -hmm. Uh, we started up last night and we're, we're having fun with it. I do think, so if you're going to take a break from playing Baldur's Gate, I think you should probably just wait for the inevitable, like definitive edition that comes out like in a year, probably. Yeah. Uh, Cause I bet they'll give it away to everybody who owns the original. Cause I'm pretty sure that's mm -hmm. what they did with Divinity. Uh, it's like kind of Larian's deal is to like not to make people not feel like they they uh, got the short end of the stick there. So maybe wait for like some sort of definitive edition where they fix all of the little things that people keep talking about. Yeah, I got the early access to it. So I spent like 40 bucks. Was it 60? I don't even remember how much it was. So I am like ahead because I heard they sold it. Yeah. They sold it for more. Yeah, it's, it. I think it's 60 bucks now. So I, I got a little bit of a deal on it, which was cool. But now... I, I am going to just take a break, take a breather. And especially when mods come out, when mods come out, yep. I'm going to come back into it because they're going to add all the races in D&D &D and all the rule sets I love. And I'm going to make my characters from D&D &D campaigns and put them into Baldur's Gate 3. And I'm very excited about that. Yeah. Looking at you, Ziggy Beast Buckle. OK, so now I have an email to read. Do you want me to read this okay. email? You ready for it? Sure. We're just going to yeah. do one today. This is from Matt, not from Japan. <laughs> it's a different Matt. OK. Uh, am I cut out for Zelda games is the subject line. Hi, Mike and Tyler, long time listener, first time writer. I am not a hardcore gamer by any means, but love listening to your podcast and playing retro and new games when I can. Growing up in the 90s, I was in the PlayStation slash sports games camp. But several years ago, I bought an N64 to recapture some lost nostalgia. You know me, I highly support this decision for everyone to play N64 games. Mm -hmm. I had always heard amazing things about Ocarina of Time, so I decided to give it a try. I played using an online guide, cheap way, I know, but as a 30-year-old with a career, I have only so many free hours. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
off and on for about two years and finally finished it this week. I completely understand the obsession. It's an absolute masterpiece between story and memorable moments, but I found myself thinking it was the longest game ever and pushing through certain parts of as a chore more than an endless love. Partially the way the game saves or lack thereof dying in the dumbest ways uh, darn those age joysticks or having to pause a dungeon to go forge for forage for arrows, etc. So my mm. question is, am I alone in feeling this way? Are Zelda games all very long slash extensive? I assume controller camera angle frustration is erased in Breath of the Wild and Tears. Should I play Majora's Mask since it's the direct sequel? I need guidance from Zelda experts. All the best. And thank you for reading my short novel, Matt, not from Japan. You are uh, the Ocarina of Time expert on this podcast, the resident. How do you true. feel about this? I have played a lot of Ocarina of Time in my day. Um, so I think uh, uh, as you compare them to other Zelda games, I think Ocarina of Time is among the longest. That's for sure. Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom notwithstanding, those are really very different games. Very fun, very great. Um, but they're kind of different because of just the open nature of them. Like you really could just kind of play them forever. Um, but uh, yeah, I think Ocarina of Time is one of the longer ones. Majora's Mask is one of the shorter ones. It is short. I remember it being a shorter Zelda compared to the other ones. Yeah. So if you, if you want to move on to that one, uh, you totally can. It, it's got some good evolution from the from Ocarina of Time and will be familiar to you in terms of how it plays because it's it, it's very similar um, and it's a lot shorter. Uh, Wind Waker is pretty short too. I want to say Twilight Princess is not as long. Ocarina of Time might be the longest maybe not longer than link to the past or i think skyward sword is pretty long too skyward sword is pretty long as someone who just played that it's pretty long i would i would also recommend like don't even don't sleep on the game boy games too oh yeah like, those are kind of short those are and shorter they're... and they're more reasonable and that's really your classic zelda experience like sure you got ocarina of time doing that in 3d but if you want to go back i would say go back more than go forward if you really want to experience yeah. zelda like go Link's Awakening is the one that I stand play by. Link's, play the Link's Awakening remake. Oh on yeah, Switch. on Switch, that's the one to play. Yeah, that's, that's really good. That's really good, and it's also a very reasonable amount of time. Like you will yeah. beat that before. And the best part is, you really don't need a guide for it. Like there might be parts that you need to look up, like I sure did. But it's pretty intuitive, especially with the remake about where you need to go next, because you'll see spots like, oh, okay, I need to go this way instead. Like there's only so many directions you can go. So I would recommend that more than say jumping ahead but breath i agree with you breath of the wild tears of the kingdom totally different style zelda game than ocarina of time and what you've done so far yeah so. uh a special shout out to twilight princess which feels uh thematically mm -hmm. more similar to ocarina of time and plays like kind of an upgraded version of it i don't think it's as long as ocarina of time yeah i would actually say and this is gonna be kind of rude because i did just play it but i would not recommend skyward sword i would recommend skyward sword if you were like I am in a Zelda mode right now and I need another Zelda game to play and you'd played all those other ones. Then I'd say go to Skyward Sword. But there's yeah. other ones that I think are a lot better. It's a strong word because, again, it's Skyward Sword still good. This is the least good of them. I'm saying, you know, yeah, it's yeah. like when we do tier lists. It's like people are like, you hate this game? Like, no, we don't hate it. We're just saying <laughs> there's, there's yeah. other ones that are better. I would go to like Link's Awakening or Twilight Princess before then. Yeah. I think uh, Minish Cap is a little bit underrated oh, yeah. also. Yeah, I played the Minish Cap. The on the, and that's on the Switch Game Boy Advance emulator. Oh, good. You can play Minish Cap. So that's a good way to cool. do it, too. Awesome. All righty. Well, we did it. Uh, as always, if you want to send us an email, you can do that at codexhistorypodcast at gmail.com. Also, our website, codexpodcast.net, has every link you could want on there. We have a Discord channel, too. And if you join our Discord you can also see our mailbag section, so you can just write a message in there for mailbags, and we'll just read those on the podcast occasionally as we go. Our Twitters are on there. Also, our oh, excuse me, our X's are on there. Also, our Trello boards are on there. I it makes it sound like our, our X partners are on there. Like all of our X's all of our X's there. live on <laughs> codexpodcast.net. <laughs> but yeah, uh, that's that's where you can find us. So we encourage you to go to that website. Also, the terrible version of Pong I made for fun is on there as well. Codex Pong is on there. So you can play yeah, that. Hey, everybody's got to make a Pong. Everyone's got to make a Pong, myself included. I decided that was important. So with that, Tyler, do you want to say bye to everybody? Goodbye, everybody. 